Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another day of invertebrate zoology. Uh, today, we are kind of crossing a big barrier here with invertebrates. Uh, we're crossing over into the agnathans. This is the almost transitory state uh, between invertebrate zoology and leaning more towards the uh, evolutionary development of vertebrates. But of course, we have a very strange pit stop along the way. They're not the most pleasant animals to look at or talk about, but they're extremely relevant uh, for both our own evolutionary history and really everything you want to learn about and study about going forward. Uh, this is the start of vertebrate life. This is our proverbial missing link uh, here with the agnathans. Uh, these are uh, animals that have been around a long time and very rarely do we get a glimpse at kind of our own fossil record uh, and where everything starts from. Uh, the origin story, if you will. Uh, and Ignathans allow us to peer into the past um, and see the transition from, again, invertebrate to vertebrate life. There, there's a lot going on with these animals, and, and we'll discuss why. I, nobody wants to have a picture of a hagfish or a lamprey up on their mantle, um, as this is my great, 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 great grandmother. But it's true. Um, the 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 knowledge we've gained from these animals tell like they they paint a beautiful Bob Ross style picture of everything we've come to know and understand as far as zoology, uh, and sheds a lot of light on uh, our again kind of origin story and our humble beginnings, if you will. So with that, we dive into Agnathans. Uh, they're defined essentially uh, as the quote unquote modern uh, vertebrates. We have two groups here, and they're very simple to narrow down. Uh, the nathostomes, everything with a jaw. So a huge group obviously branches out from here. Mixiniforms and petromyzontiforms are a very limited subclass here. Uh, they're the agnathans. After that, everything else has jaws. Uh, that's kind of the easy way to define everything. The nathostomes are all our jawed vertebrates. Agnathans are the jawless vertebrates, of which, again, there's a very small sample pool here, but need to be acknowledged, especially if you're understanding uh, vertebrate zo or invertebrate zoology or vertebrate zoology. We need to acknowledge the agnathans here because it's a huge evolutionary leap, and it's so fortunate, again, that we have the opportunity uh, to still see these animals and, and be able to study them. So nathostomes are everything with jaws. That's literally from this point on, everything you'll ever learn about in both the program, in life, every vertebrate from here on out has jaws. We gotta make a pit stop here at the jawless vertebrates. Uh, it's a weird stop, but I hope by the end of this, you guys will see how relevant it really is. As far as the groupings, pretty easy here. Uh, Mixiniforms are the hagfish. Uh, Petromyzontiforms are the lampreys. These are our only two groups within Agnatha. Uh, we'll discuss the perils of defining them as vertebrates in a second, but relatively easy given the taxonomy we've built on until now, all the different groupings uh, from the dendrobranchs to the pleosiomatas, um, all the different outgroupings here for once we get to make it easy on you. Uh, Mixini forms and petromyzontiforms, that's it. Uh, two groups, two very different animals. It, it's very clear lines uh, defined when it comes to taxonomy, which is honestly kind of a relief uh, given everything we dive into over the course of a semester. It, it's, it's a big sigh of relief uh, to have two groups that are easily identifiable, recognizable, and have clear delineations with why they're separated. There's not a, a lot of bl blurred lines here. Um, so yeah, it does provide a, a sense of, okay, now this makes sense. Everything clicks into place very easily here. Within uh, Mixini forms, uh, this is where we have 
uh, another easy delineation between uh, two groups. Uh, this is in the genre or the genus category. And the way they're defined is just where they live. That's it. Again, another awesome way. We, we don't get this opportunity very often, so that's why I'm highlighting it. Uh, we very rarely get that opportunity to be like, I know how these animals are classified very easily. Here it goes. Uh, and it's just the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so you live on technically different sides of the world. Uh, and that's our defining trait. That's the factor. The Pacific Ocean version and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Atlantic Ocean we'll probably talk about a little more uh, just based off we have more knowledge about that genre. But yeah, so far so good in the taxonomy category because we can define these animals relatively easily. Uh, we've got two different groups. And then even within the groups, the way we're separating them is just what side of the world they live on. Uh, so, so far so good. Don't worry, it'll get more complicated. But for now, take solace in the fact that we can define these animals very easily, uh, both off visual cues and then what part of the world we're finding them in. Uh, so yes, it, it, it's a nice breath of fresh air when it comes to taxonomy and how confusing everything's been so far. I told you it wouldn't last long, here we are. Uh, the classification of these animals has come under not scrutiny, but certainly controversy. Uh, and it's it, it's a tricky path to go down. The, oops, excuse me, um, issue of whether or not hagfish, they're the ones that throw the wrench in it. Petromyzontiforms uh, are much easier to classify uh, as either vertebrates or chordates at the very least. But here we have a, a very tricky issue, um, a real sticky wicket, if you will, of whether or not this animal should be classified as a vertebrate fish or an organism that possibly developed into a vertebrate uh, and then degenerated back. Uh, so there's some issues that pop up there. Why in the world would this, first off, be even a talking point? Um, does anybody have a guess as to why this is such a, a sticking point when it comes to evolutionary history, vertebrate, uh, and then of course the awkward chordate point. Um, it, it brings up a lot of taxonomy, uh, taxonomical, taxonomical hierarchy issues. There, there's a lot going on here. Does anybody have an idea of why this would still be a, a debate point? Um, so just in like taxonomy, I mean, phylum and subphylum are gonna be pretty like important when it comes to landing on where they should be in research, um, generally as we're like making changes in taxonomy, we're seeing like family level changes, not changes on the like phylum level, um, pretty solid on whether like you're a chordate or not. Um, and hagfish, funny enough, one second, babe, um, are the only like living animal, they have a skull, but no like vertebral column. Um, so there's still like a lot of debate and as far as I know it's leaning towards they did have a like vertebrae and then degenerated back and lost it um, but that's still not fully like solid yet yeah um, and I'm glad that that was brought up the idea that the animal had a vertebral column and then degenerated back uh, this is not an uncommon theme just so you guys know in evolutionary history uh, testidines, so turtles are another great example of an animal that went supposedly from diapsid to anapsid skull. Uh, it's a, another day, another lecture, but the idea that an animal developed along with its kind of group and then degenerated back to almost the primitive form, that's what we're looking at again here. Uh, the main thing we're pointing out, and again, I'm, I'm so glad it was brought up, the idea that we're still reclassifying usually family, genre, uh, and then species, that's kind of where the science is now. To start all the way up at phylum and still have an argument, that's crazy talk. Uh, phylums sh should be sorted out by now. The fact that there's still a little bit of controversy surrounding the hagfish is insane from a scientific standpoint. Um, and what we're gonna find is again, the importance of that subphylum, almost everything you talk about within the program and everything you're going to work with 
falls into the category uh, vertebrata. They all have, uh, and vertebrata, just FYI, guys, is the origin of what should be the spinal cord. The spine itself isn't that big of a deal. Uh, not saying get rid of your spine because you don't need it, but the spine itself isn't what we're focused on when we talk about vertebrates. Uh, the spine serves as a, if you guys have ever like uh, seen construction being done, you know that when they put wires in the wall, uh, you use uh, some conduit uh, and piping to internally house that wiring. That's what your spine really is. Yes, it's a cool bone that everything connects to. Yes, it helps you stand upright. Like, good job, spine. But the real important part is that it's hollow and it allows the entire nervous system to travel throughout the body. That's the importance of the spine. That's the relevance there. Uh, we have a hardwired uh, cable running through our body uh, that's allowing the rest of our uh, external organs and body parts to give feedback right kind of to the motherboard, if you will. There's a very central pathway down your own back. That's the importance of the vertebral column. Uh, here we lack a true vertebral column, but this is why the term chordata comes up. Uh, it's the start of a notochord, which is the start of the spine. Uh, that is present in both larval and adult forms for the most part uh, when it comes to hagfish. But I, I guess I'm just trying to highlight the fact that they're not vertebrates, but they need to be included. That's why the first phylum is chordata because this is the evolutionary start of what will eventually be the spinal cord. It's a uh, important indicator on the map, if you will, of our evolutionary history. It's chordata and then subphylum vertebrata. Uh, we, we can't acknowledge all the vertebrates in the world until we call them chordates first. Uh, and the hagfish here, as beautiful as they are, wind up being the organism that we highlight as that proverbial missing link. There they are, they're beautiful. That's the starting point. The starting point for more than likely everything you wanna work with at zoos and aquaria, uh, this is the start of the chordate slash vertebral column. Mixini forms uh, make up a group that is so very hard to define. Uh, back in the day when I was in school, I actually had to do a huge dissertation and paper on Mixini forms uh, as to whether or not they are basically, and I'll, I'll sum it up, I'm not gonna read you the paper now, it will bore you to tears. Uh, they wind up being very hard to label as to whether or not they degenerated, i.e. like de-evolved, or they're just a primitive snapshot at a living fossil, basically. Uh, we know that they share traits with both invertebrate and vertebrate life. We know they remain relatively unchanged. Uh, the only consensus out there, though, uh, that still is up for debate uh, is did they devolve or have they just stayed awkward, kind of? Um, that, that's kind of the only thing out there. Everyone agrees that they're the transitory state between invertebrate and vertebrate life, but did they at some point evolve and then transition back to this primitive style. Uh, that, that's really the only thing out there. The idea that we, we know through fossil record when they started, and again, I told you guys this a million times, if we find fossils in the fossil record, we know there's millions of years preceding that. It's not like we found the first thing ever to, to appear in the dirt. Um, we know that millions of years precede that. Uh, so we always give them a little bit of extra cushion when it comes to the timeline. The hagfish timeline and lineage dates back about 600 million years. So again, you got a picture at the same time that this is million, hundreds of millions of years before anything even transitions to land. Uh, Mixini forms start and start developing this like, if you're picture like your sci-fi movies where you're searching for life on earth, uh, you're scrolling through the computer screen and doing the 360 view. All of a sudden, you see this little star burst. Uh, you see a, a, a blip of light. And through ev the evolutionary timeline, that's kind of where Mixini forms sit. Uh, we're searching and looking for answers, figuring out where we came from. And all of a sudden, there's this weird, very ugly 
uh, blip of light that shows up on the screen. That's the hagfish. Uh, it winds up making them the oldest living and still around today, uh, which is very fortunate, but the oldest lineage of all the vertebrates that come after. Uh, and this is their monophyletic trait. Uh, just, just as part of review, humor me, please. Um, important though here to talk about monophyles versus our other phyletic groupings. Uh, so just for review, does anybody remember what goes along with monophyletic and the, the kind of outliers here? So with monophyletic groups, um, that typically contains the most common ancestor and then all of its descendants, all of its descendants. Um, and then with paraphyletic taxon, that's referring to a common ancestor point. Um, oh, I forgot to add, I'm sorry. Monophyletic is also considered clade. Um, so that's like the easiest way for me to remember that it means basically all of that one point descendants uh, or all of that one point ancestors descendants um, in, a, in the same group. But then paraphyletic taxon is when a group of organisms includes the most recent ancestor as kind of a, a starting point. And then not all of the uh, descendants, but uh, most of them, it just doesn't include all of them, um, but most of them that have similar uh, characteristics. And then polyphyletic taxon is a group of organisms typically lumped together, um, though not through a common ancestor or the most recent ancestor, but uh, lumped together, I'm trying to figure out how to word this, sorry, lumped together um, based on characteristics that they don't share with the most common ancestor. So I like to, I like to like remember and correct me if I'm steering people wrong, I'm sorry, but I like to remember polyphyletic taxon as those that are kind of um, excluded from the par paraphyletic groups. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, I'm, I'm glad it was brought up. Remember, again, I know this is kind of review, but it doesn't hurt to say again, monophyles are the only recognized clade. Uh, the other two groups become outliers, but of course that's how we're studying them. And here we're looking at a, a great example. To, in, to be a true monophyletic clade, let's say you want to study mammals, to be a true monophyly, uh, you're going to have to zoom out of the Google Earth version, zoom out from the picture, and still include mixini forms. Because, yes, mammals are completely different, uh, totally different animal, pun intended. But if we're looking at the fact that we have vertebral columns, uh, mixini forms have to join the party. It's okay to study in a paraphyletic uh, taxa uh, group. Uh, or a polyphyly, where we're either uh, doing a convergent evolution thing, where we're looking at animals that share traits now, but have no common ancestral uh, relative, or animals that exclude other groups, uh, i.e. reptiles excluding uh, birds and mammals, that's okay. But if, like, like I said, if, if we're looking at, if, if we're studying humans, primates, you name it, and we're studying them as a uh, individual grouping, we have to include Mixini forms no matter what, because uh, this is the start of what makes us quote unquote so advanced. Uh, the spinal cord, nerve endings, things like that, the way the animal's organized, Mixini forms have to be invited to that very awkward party where they come in, like nobody, you feel like you didn't send them the invitation, but you have to shake hands with Mixini forms uh, just to say, hey, thanks for the spinal column. Really appreciate it. It's an awkward party, yes, but it needs to be recognized. And part of the awkwardness that comes at this weird party we've invented comes with the fact that they don't have a true vertebrae. Uh, they don't even have a skeleton for the most part. It's cartilaginous, uh, so meaning the rigidity of our bones provides us a lot of structure and strength, but comes at its, uh, I guess, its own cost. Most of us aren't complaining. Uh, those of you at home without your skeletons, uh, certainly 
can relate to what we're talking about now, but most of us are sitting around with our skeletons uh, and allowing our bodies to at least maintain its form. Here we have a cartilaginous skeleton. This is gonna carry over, and again, this is why it's so important to point these animals out. This is going to carry over into a ton of fish species, mostly sharks, skates, rays, uh, whole cephalons, things like that. Uh, it, it, we can see, I, I guess, sorry, I know I'm kind of geeking out, but I think it's it's so cool that we are able to see this missing link, I guess, between, we think there's always fish uh, and then worms in the ocean and invertebrates. We literally have a visual representation that we can study today of when everything changed. This is a game changer. We have an animal that develops the start of a notochord and develops a cartilaginous skeleton that will be passed on uh, to sharks. Uh, you look at your great white shark. Yeah, this is the reason it exists right here. Uh, this is a, a huge blip on the radar of evolutionary history. And it's a game changer. I, I, I again, I, I don't expect anybody to give out uh, Mixini Forms awards uh, or have a poster up in your house. But yeah, just evolution wise, man, this is, guys, this is a huge deal. Uh, this starts everything we know about vertebrate life going forward. We are in the Ignathan group, uh, so they do not have jaws. What they have basically is a horizontally moving uh, plate in their mouth. Best example I have right now off the top of my head is more like a, a cigar cutter. Uh, so something that slides back and forth. And so can, we don't wanna say chew, uh, but can start at least the mastication process in some way, they scrape along. Uh, again, we'll go back to cats and I think we've used this analogy before, but if you at home have cats uh, and you've ever been licked by your cat, you can feel how that tongue's not just licking you, but almost scraping you, uh, pulling things off. Uh, that's the ideal model behind the cat tongue. Uh, it's designed to, let's say a tiger or a lion. Uh, after you've subdued your prey, uh, the tongue is designed actually to scrape hair so you can get right to the flesh. It's supposed to start taking things off. Uh, here we have a mouth that resembles, I don't know, the most horrifying cat tongue ever. Uh, it, it's definitely not nearly as, as cute as, as your cat that may nudge up to you at your desk uh, and give you a lick or two. This is the nightmare version, uh, but same style is used here. Uh, we've got horizontally moving structures that are going to start shaving away at whatever prey item they've, they're, they're willing to ingest. So uh, very interesting look here. Uh, we've got a couple things to talk about. Uh, for the most part, we see a pretty straightforward animal. Uh, here would be the mouth, ideally, surrounded by tentacles, uh, obviously for a tactile or chemosensory function. And the animal at first glance looks relatively simple to, to process and label. However, uh, we have a, a twist in the story, an M. Night Shyamalan development of, wow, we thought we knew what was going on, we don't. The mouth is a slit with fleshy barbels around it, uh, and the animal possesses a single nostril. Kind of unique, it's gonna carry on to the petromized ontoforms as well, but uh, the anatomy, or if there was a diagram for this animal, it gets really weird when we try to label it. If your average person were to look at this picture, everyone would say mouth and then maybe gills. That's probably the go-to uh, would be my guess uh, for your average person up in the grove at the college. Uh, yeah, things get weird from here, sorry. The animal projects itself forward with the appearance that this is in a mouth agape. That is not the case. This is actually the single nostril that we just talked about in the last slide. This is the nostril. It's designed to take in, you can see how, um, I guess, agape it is, uh, designed to take in a huge amount of chemosensory cues, uh, detecting usually rotting flesh, uh, but certainly other living animals. That's a pretty big sensory organ on the front of your face, but it is not the mouth. The mouth looks like this. 
Ah, uh, there she is. Uh, this is that, let's go back two slides. Here we have nostril. Here we have this closed up kind of hidden mouth. And then when they're ready to feed, we transition to this mode. So here's nostril. And then the mouth has finally presented itself in its glorious fashion. Definitely more of a alien looking face hugger type thing uh, than initially meets the eye. I, I don't think anybody was rushing to the uh, getting in line to give these animals a, a kiss and hold them anyway. Now you should be even more put off. Uh, it's definitely a interesting twist in development uh, with how these animals are uh, actually laid out in regard to their anatomy. <clears throat> with with uh, their development from offspring, we have, they're not blind. Uh, it, it makes sense through millions of years of evolution to eventually just go blind since you're using all your chemosensory skills. But we have degenerative eye spots, uh, which brings up a, a strange point. And hopefully I've instilled this in you. Anytime we say something like degenerative eye spots, I hope you're not just marking down on your sheet like the eyes degenerate, the end. No, we, we've got a bit more to go there. There's more to talk about. Uh, if you're, we're doing a short answer, essay type thing, there's more to a degenerative eye spot than meets the eye, but um bum uh, there, There's more to it. Uh, degenerative eye spots really do have a place with an animal like this, and it's much more important than just being born blind or being born without the ability to detect your surroundings. What do we mean when we say degenerative eye spots? Again, keeping in mind that this is an aquatic animal. Anybody have an idea what we mean when degenerative eye spots and what that really transitions to? So <clears throat> we think of degenerative and like, yeah, we immediately think like they're degenerating, um, but it's not something that's happening like to the animal in their lifetime. Um, degenerative just meaning at one point they did have better vision as far as we can tell. And they have now come to land in this weird gray area of just having like a simple eye spot um and that's just not eyeballs like we would think of them like no lens no motor cranial muscle um and nerves stuff like that um really just capable of detecting light or shadow um and when we're talking about aquatic animals that's really going to play a part in them detecting depth um as we talk about light or lack thereof um, as we get into deeper depths of the ocean and there is no light or they're detecting simple um, shadow above them but not capable of making out actual um, detailed images. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's so difficult as that reminder, but I hope that little alarm triggers in your head when we start talking about degenerative eye spots, because that's exactly what it is. When you're in an aqueous environment, eye spots are still important, not for the detail, but for things like depth. Uh, changing to an aquatic environment uh, alters the game, so to speak. We're not talking day, night. We're talking light, dark in, in regards to, am I going deeper in the ocean or am I, am I going to shore? Uh, and so it does, on the, on the surface, I guess, makes sense for these animals to be born blind, but they're not. Um, they have degenerative, very, very primitive, almost unusable. Uh, like they're not gonna get their driver's license anytime soon, but we need that ability to detect light and dark, not because we know it's day or night, it's because it tells us the depth that we're going to. Uh, we know we're like, for example, leaving a coral reef and going off a coastal drop off that's where light and dark come into play when you're an aquatic species. Uh, the, the depth aspect is a very, very big deal. Speaking of the depths at which they reside, uh, we've observed them in extremely shallow waters and crazy, crazy depths. Uh, so very flexible, I guess pun intended, uh, species. Part of that relies on their flexibility and the fact that they don't have a rigid skeleton in place uh, to confine them to one ocean depth. 
when you are made out of cartilage and don't really possess a vertebral column, yeah, guess what? All of a sudden you get to locomote through different parts of the ocean. It also allows you a very bizarre way to, uh, I guess, carve out your own niche uh, in the habit in, in your respective habitat. Uh, you're able to burrow and sit and wait. You basically have, again, let's picture the diagram. All that's going to be protruding is that single nostril. Here's the mouth on the underside. You basically have a very awkward, strange way to position yourself where all you're doing is sitting, waiting, and detecting chemosensory cues. Very helpful for them. Because you don't have arms and legs and you're not, a, a lot of the animals we've talked about so far can dig their own burrows. Here we don't have that luxury, I guess. Uh, essentially what they do is they start, there, there's no way to describe it other than just awkwardly battery ram uh, their way into the substrate. They push their heads in as much as they can, uh, start moving dirt and shaking their head side to side. Because they're vertebrate invertebrates, um, they're able to dig about halfway down for their body size. Uh, they dig a huge hole, uh, again, huge in comparison to their body, huge hole enough for them to fit into. Once they get halfway through, they, instead of backing out and turning in, uh, the head just simply turns around, does a 180, comes back out the hole, and the rest of the body follows suit by going down. Um, and so they'll, and I guess, fold themselves in half. Uh, so all you need is half your body size, burrow down, and then because you're able to flip on a proverbial dime, uh, the animal's able to conceal itself entirely within that substrate. You only need half your body size because you can basically bend in half at any point uh, and fit the entire body down there. So it's a little awkward to get the burrow dug, but once you've done it, uh, extremely, extremely efficient. And we're gonna find that with these animals in general about the efficiency. Uh, they're efficient both in their own uh, anatomy and body makeup. They're also efficient for the environment. Uh, one of the things that they do is convert a lot of the benthic, so bottom of the ocean biomass uh, back into the earth, if you will. They're notorious for being scavengers. We'll discuss later, they're also effective hunters, uh, but yeah, they, they, there's a lot more uh, than meets the eye, I guess, with these animals. The thing I wanna highlight though, is this churning of benthic biomass. I, I can't explain how critical it is. Why do you guys think that's like the most relevant role that these animals fill, the ro most relevant niche? I think it's because it, it really contributes to um, the carbon the carbon cycle within the ocean. So when all of this dead matter floats to the floor, um, they they pretty much act act like earthworms in the sense uh, they eat all of that uh, anything that just like floats to the floor. And um, as they're burrowing, they're churning that substrate and they're getting. Um, their byproducts back out into the water, which then floats up and or upwards and becomes energy that other organisms like phytoplankton can use. And um, it's just like this huge, it's just this big circle of just basically how the whole nitrogen cycle, carbon cycle, everything within the ocean uh, and the sun works together, if that makes sense at all. Yeah, it's it's a very underrated role. Uh, they fill that kind of earthworm niche for the ocean. We need something down there uh, churning through organic biomass, uh, putting it back out there as potential new energy. Um, otherwise, we have a bunch of dead organisms that create nitrogen spikes and alter the chemistry of the ocean. We need something down there. Again, like picture uh, a compost bed, things like that. We need something down there churning through everything to make sure we're making the most of the energy that the ocean provides. Uh, so very understated role, uh, but couldn't be more critical for the survival of ocean environments in general. We need, this is, like everybody puts their trash out on Wednesday or Thursday, like 
we need somebody to come by and pick all that up. Otherwise, things are going to get awkward, start building up. Um, these are the, the, the trash men, so to speak, of the benthic biomass version. Uh, I, I just I, I think it's so understated what these animals do. Earthworms can't live down here. Uh, salt water would uh, desiccate them immediately. So it's a very not pleasant to look at animal, but definitely deserves an award. I understand if as you hang the medal, the medallion around their neck, uh, you don't really want to look at them, but they definitely kind of deserve their own trophy and should have their own uh, round of applause when it comes to churning over this benthic biomass. As if they weren't beautiful enough to begin with, let's talk about their other great ability. It's the fact that they produce copious amounts of slime. Uh, they have what looks like, and I know we've discussed it before, but looks like a lateral line system. Uh, it's a series of, they almost look like glands um, or pores that run along the side of the body. Uh, this, is where, this is where the magic happens, kids. Uh, they're able to produce copious amounts of slime, and it's through an incredible uh, chemistry reaction. It doesn't work without the ocean around them. If they are stressed or held or attacked by a predator, uh, they excrete a very strange uh, protein-based material that combines with salt water. Uh, it's, I, I guess, the best example I have, any of you that have done some cooking, you guys know when you take that tiny bowl of water and you're trying to, let's say you're making a soup and you want to thicken it up, you can stir cornstarch in to a tiny bit of water and then add it to the, the rest of the pot. Uh, it's going to thicken that entire pot, even though it started off very small. That's kind of the best analogy I have for slime production. It's going to thicken everything around it, but it needs the presence of that water. So, for example, like on its own, if you were to pour cornstarch in your hand, not going to do a whole lot. It's a powder, uh, like kind of the end. Once it comes in contact with water, though, that's when we make our bread and butter. Uh, and with Mixini form slime production, uh, they've done studies of how much water it takes up, basically. Right now, it sits at five and a half gallons. Uh, so your iconic Homer's bucket you get from Home Depot, uh, put a Mixini form in there and disturb it, that entire bucket becomes slime. No water left. Uh, it's, I don't know, my kids, my kids and I always do science experiments. I'm trying to think of one that's relevant where you have a body of water and all of a sudden it's taken up completely. But yeah, it, it, it just changes the entire environment. Five and a half gallons is a lot for a slimy little organism to create. Um, and aside from the, the gross factor, this is not like a Nickelodeon prank. Uh, this is not a cool uh, cartoonish type thing. Uh, the gelatinous material they create out of almost thin air uh, or thin water, I guess, comes with a very intentional, in, intentional consequence uh, for predators, or anyone that's provoking them. Uh, it, it carries a lot of, again, pun intended, weight with it. Uh, this gelatinous material is much more than just, oh, slimy. Uh, yeah, it, it's very intentional. Again, this is what you get with a 100 million year head start on basically all life on Earth. Uh, so they figured it out and they, they have a lot more to it uh, than initially meets the eye. The Initial intent behind it is to clog a predator's gills. So let's say I'm a, a usually a small shark spe species cruising along the bottom. I see what looks like a giant earthworm, looks like easy prey. I go up to bite it. All of a sudden, they change my environment into a death trap. Uh, the slime is so thick and, and viscous, uh, like mucosal almost. Um, it starts to clog everything. Uh, the nostrils get impaired, so you can't uh, smell. Usually, that's how a lot of animals see. Vision is blurred. Uh, and then it will actually be hard to... I mean, this is like the equivalent of like the iconic movie scene where somebody's choking at a restaurant. And everybody's looking around like, what do we do? Where's the doctor? Uh, 
the gills get clogged, the animal's unable to breathe, see, smell. It's a complete sensory overload, plus the fact that you're now choking. Uh, instead of in the video where somebody's choking at the restaurant, instead of something being lodged in your esophagus, now we've got a bunch of a mucosal cloud clogging the predator's gills, which is again where they breathe. And so it becomes a complete panic mode. Uh, they try to swim away, shake their head very violently, uh, try to dislodge this proverbial clog that's in their throat. Um, it's 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 much more than just ew slimy. Uh, it's it's the real deal. Uh, more often than not, uh, animals either have to violently get away from the animal they were about to predate upon, or they just die. Uh, we have a weird defense mechanism that sometimes winds up as a prey acquisition style. We have an animal that can clog the gills of a predator. And if that predator is to die, now nah, you know what, I'll just go down and feast upon him. Uh, very quickly, the tables can turn, uh, I guess, with the Mixini forms. Uh, so they've developed a lot of adaptations that make them either completely undesirable as prey items or like enter at your own risk type thing. Uh, you might be eaten instead of doing the eating. Uh, type situation. So cool adaptations there. When it comes to the slime production, uh, we have a very unique behavior here, and it's what we call the overhand knot. Essentially what this is, uh, any of you that were in Boy or Girl Scouts can attest knot tying is obviously a very important part. Uh, again, I'm not going to, we're not at summer camp. I'm not going to go through it all. An overhand knot essentially allows these animals to create a knot at the top of the body and then move it and work it the whole way down. This is arguably their most important trait, uh, the best feature they've evolved. First off, you don't have a rigid skeleton, stupid skeleton always getting in the way, uh, but you also can manipulate your body in ways that other animals can't. Uh, and so what they'll do is form a you can kind of picture it like a slip knot at the top of the body. They'll move the knot down instead of retying it. Uh, they move the knot all the way down the body and it releases them uh, from both their own slime cloud because that's a very real danger. Obviously getting your own body clogged. Um, it, it's picture like um, wringing out a, a wash rag, I guess. Let's say you, you have a wash rag that's in tons of in your sink, there's food coloring in there, lots of slime, weird stuff. The first thing you're going to do is instead of wringing it out, let's say you start at the top and pinch your fingers in a tight circle around it and move your way down the wash rag until all that moisture or debris is released. Uh, that's essentially what the overhand knot does. Uh, it releases them from their own slime cloud, also allows them to release them maybe from a, a bite. Uh, they're, it's like the human equivalent of escaping from a straight jacket. Uh, very flexible, very um, mobile and bendy, so to speak, and allows them a great degree of special specialization when it comes to uh, freeing and releasing and getting out of quote unquote awkward situations. One of the other unique traits we're going to find here uh, is typically we find a defense mechanism in animals. That's no big deal. Sorry, evolution, but kind of par for the course now. We also find ways to acquire prey. Also, cool, no big deal. But uh, we also have the ability to use this as a way to acquire prey or ingest substance. Uh, what we have essentially, and this is awkward without being in the classroom, uh, basically the overhand knot creates a fulcrum. And what I mean by that uh, is Picture the sword in the stone type story. If you're, there's something lodged into the ground or the wall where you're at, uh, and you're trying to get it out, first thing you're gonna do obviously is pull it, right? But if that doesn't work, the next thing you're gonna do is maybe put your foot on that rock or the wall and then really put all your weight into it. That's the fulcrum. Uh, and that's what they're able to do with that overhand knot. If I am a limbless, almost invertebrate. Rawr. And I'm trying to eat this dead fish. Right? 
here's my crazy teeth, my disgusting mouth. Uh, and I just go and try to bite off that animal. Uh, probably not a lot's going to go on. Again, remember my the dental plates these animals possess only move up and down. Um, it's not a great success rate of me ingesting the bite of food. However, if I can form this huge knot around my body, now all of a sudden my mouth can bite on and I can use my, my knot, I guess, uh, in order to provide that fulcrum, just like putting your leg on the sword in the stone, um, you're going to put your weight into it and put your foot into it. You have another spot to balance your weight. So now this is pressing down on the fish. This is pressing down on the fish. And now I'm able to scrape and then pull back uh, from that prey item. Uh, so we've got an animal that's utilized its own defense mechanism into a feeding behavior uh, that works very, very well for them. It allows them to pry off food uh, at a surprisingly effective rate. Um, and, and makes them all that more effective. Usually we have definitions between uh, defense mechanisms and feeding acquisition styles. Here, that line has been blurred uh, to make room for all that Mixini forms can do. There's that beautiful slime. Uh, it is being used uh, a lot in scientific research. Uh, hopefully one day, fingers crossed, uh, a alternative to petroleum byproducts which just, pun intended again, uh, flood the market uh, and it saturated our ecosystem so badly. Um, arguably one of the biggest threats to our ecosystems now is petroleum-based products. But here we have a possible alternative. Hopefully science keeps rolling forward with it. <clears throat> the uh, reproductive styles, again, sorry gang, there's not a huge uh, GoFundMe account set up to go out and study arguably one of the ugliest animals on earth. Um, the, the science isn't there, the money certainly isn't there. And so we don't know a ton about their reproductive styles. We know we can observe in captivity, but of course that's an artificial environment. So it doesn't paint the real picture. Uh, yeah, they, they've been really difficult to observe and get a, a true natural history of these animals. We further complicate that by diving a little more into how these animals actually reproduce. Uh, there's no copulatory organ, so meaning there, there's no uh, true, I, I guess the, the mammal version is the easiest to understand. Uh, there's no copulation in that regard. We're basically broadcast spawning um, where you're just releasing gametes into the ocean. Uh, Fertilization is gonna occur externally now instead of internally. But we have a few twists in that story. Uh, where the animal is able to reproduce uh, by, again, sending a gamete out, it's not always the same gamete. Um, there's cases where we have a, a kind of uh, a transitory state, I guess. Uh, between, uh, and again, when we say sexes, when we're talking about inverts, it's much more than that. Um, it doesn't mean you have a boy that can reproduce as a girl type thing. The animal isn't changing genders or sexes. It's changing what gametes it can produce. Um, and when we have an animal now that takes that a step further uh, to environmentally based sex changes or gamete producing changes, that suggests something to us. Uh, that tells us a little more about them. Why is this, again, changing of sexes is the okay word for it, but we're talking about gametes, but why would this, why would this show up in the arguably oldest living vertebrate species? Um, so like with the sequential hermaphrodite or like the hermaphroditism um, of moving um, from, either like male or female to, or female to male based on like environmental needs. Um, we see it in clownfish as well. Um, so like clownfish will live with like one female, one male, and then a couple uh, smaller like non-reproductive males. 
And if the female were to be removed or like fishing circumstances, the female were to disappear, um, the male, the largest male is going to then change to a female um, in like sequential hermaphroditism. And then the smallest male is going to mature up. And that's going to ensure that that group is able to continue to reproduce, even though their female has been removed. They don't need to go find a new female. It's not a weird bachelor group. Um, he's just going to assume, you know, the hierarchy next largest becomes a female. And then we continue down the line. Um, so like with like hagfish and stuff like this, we're ensuring that anything like if there's two say males in the area they're able to reproduce they're going to be able to switch over per se and become female and produce those gametes rather than letting their population die off or spending that much extra time going to find a different sex um they've kind of just evolved to work with what they have and what they can find in their environment and always be able to continue their genetic line. Yeah, it kind of sheds a very disturbing light on Finding Nemo. Um, so sorry for that, to burst that bubble. Uh, but yeah, it's a great way to ensure the survivability of your species without having to go and seek out and acquire new mates. Um, as strange as it sounds to us, and as foreign as it is to the, the mammalian lifestyle, what a good insurance policy and backup plan uh, to be able to uh, transition, if you will, into a fully functional female or male, uh, depending on what the environment needs. Uh, it's, again, like, sounds weird, but you guys got to tip your hats to the effectiveness at which these animals are able to reproduce uh, through the changing of, again, sexes, gender, really the gametes you're producing. Uh, but all are, are relevant uh, and and create an absolute game changer when it comes to survivability. With, oops, I went, sorry, my dog came in and distracted me. Uh, the sequential hermaphroditism that was just talked about usually goes uh, in a order. We call it protandric hermaphroditism. Um, this is where traditionally you go from male, and as you get later in life, you transition i guess uh and uh female it doesn't change the it, it's such an awkward subject to broach because we're so used to that mammalian style um it doesn't change the really the genetic makeup of the animal by any means it's whatever gametes you're producing um so male into female has nothing to do with either appearance behavior things like that it just changes what sex cells you're going to produce sperm and then you transition to egg that, that's the best way to describe it. Uh, that's what's really going on. Um, there's not like, it, it's it's not the equivalent of like slapping on a wig and putting on makeup and things like that, uh, or like growing a mustache and then putting on a polo shirt. I know that's not what every guy wears, but that's the only thing I have in my closet. So that's my go-to. Um, it, it's not the same as like these traditional uh, gender role switches that we, we somehow confine our fragile little minds into these boxes. It's much more than that. Uh, and it's so much simpler, really. Uh, you keep being you, you keep your identity, you're just gonna produce a different sex cell. Uh, and through that process, these animals have been able to basically be blind, disgusting, uh, not a great dating scene, and somehow still outlive everything on earth by hundreds of millions of years. So it, it works. Um, there, there's no complaining about it. Uh, it winds up being a very effective model. This is what we were talking about with that gonadal shifts. Um, the idea that an animal can transition between, again, sexes, yes, the gametes they produce. We have a little wrinkle in everything here. And that's when it comes to this sequential, again, usually protandric, meaning male to female. Something funky happens along the way here with her hermaphroditic shifts uh, where we have an animal that as it is quote unquote transitioning uh, an animal that can produce possibly both gametes at the same time uh, and that changes 
changes it over to a functional hermaphrodite as opposed to a sequential hermaphrodite. What's the, the kind of little asterisk by this whole thing, the little caveat uh, that separates sequential hermaphroditism from functional hermaphroditism? Anybody want to take a stab at that? So with, you know, this is kind of going to be review, so I apologize. With sequential hermaphroditism, hermaphroditism, um, you have your organism changing from male to female, um, typically because of, you know, to kind of like balance out the environment and con specifics uh, to make sure that like the biggest and the best survive, et cetera. Um, and you covered, uh, Protandry. Pro, uh, there, I mean, there's bidirectional sex changing, there's protandric, and uh, which is male to female, and then there's uh, proto, protogeny, protogeny, which is one of like, I, I feel like it's like one of the most common, at least in my research I've seen. Um, but animals who are sequential have that benefit, benefactor of, you know, balancing out for the populace for, you know, future generations and then simultaneous hermaphrodites have the have almost double the ability well no they do have double the ability of um, or chance of spreading their genetics out so you have you have organisms like the sea hare a lot of sea hare species and a lot of other invertebrates will do um this is like the simultaneous part they, they're able to copulate and be copulated with, so to speak. So they're able to pass on sperm and also have become fertilized uh, and they produce both gametes. So then you have your tunics who um, can start or who are also in like the sequential, I believe. Um, they're sequential hermaphrodites. The tunics are ones that will accidentally self fertilize. Uh, which is not so great, but also has some kind of benefit to the reproductive fitness. Um, so tunics are one that will go from uh, one sex to the other. And as you had mentioned, like they'll, you know, during the shift, they'll produce one gaming, start to shift, produce the other gaming to release broadcast into the ocean. And uh, there have been studies where a lot of these broadcast uh, gametes will not avoid each other like, oh, that's me. I can't do that, you know, <laughs> but, you know, um, they try these organisms try to avoid self fertilization, though it does happen um, there. So like the benefit of being simultaneous is you can put out your genetics and uh, in double forms, but then there is the risk of self-fertilization. Sorry if I'm kind of going off <laughs> off topic a little bit, uh, but this is like such a broad, it's so, there's so many things that you can, so many different directions you can go with just hermaphroditism. hermaphroditism um, so with self-fertilization, there are organisms that can successfully reproduce with themselves to form a temporary population, um, almost like Okay, so a short story time. Um, say you're a tunic and you're producing eggs and you're broadcasting them, and then you're like, okay, time to produce sperm. So you start shifting your energy towards producing sperm, and uh, you know, your your gametes are are fertilizing each other, not completely by accident. It's just sperm sees an egg and says, okay, cool, home. Um, sometimes if it's Okay, sorry. I'm so sorry. Let me re refocus. Um, if other gametes are maybe a day away uh, or a couple days away or something, if that makes sense, this is totally hypothetical. I apologize. Um, you know, so these new organisms, I just completely confused everybody, I feel like. Okay, let me start over, Alex. I'm so sorry. The benefit of self-fertilization is to create a new uh, colony of the same genetics as a temporary population, but there are organisms that are able to not be affected by uh, the genetic, like, well, what's it called? 
the bottleneck effect. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are organisms that there are organisms that are and not affected at all. So just depending on your ability to um, reproduce, to have those or that generation reproduce with potential other uh, gametes from different genetics, if that makes sense. And I'll stop now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, on a, it, it, I'm glad uh, someone else said it uh, so I didn't have to. It is confusing. It doesn't make sense. We've all been so uh, ingrained with the idea of genetic diversity and how important it is. We know, like, again, I know most of you are here for to work with mammals. Uh, so sorry for making you suffer through invertebrates, but it's true, like, with mammals, we have SSPs and what animal is genetically valuable to a, a program or a, a breeding scenario. Not the case here. Uh, we've gotten more primitive, but as we've highlighted billions of times now, uh, primitive doesn't mean bad. It doesn't mean janky. Uh, and it is an awkward situation to try to explain. We're so concerned with mammals and uh, breeding programs and genetic diversity here we have the best model ever, and sorry, it's not even close. Uh, we're so worried with, and again, I'm not trying to downplay um, incestuous bloodlines and things like that. Like, yeah, please still, this isn't Game of Thrones. Let's not do that as mammals. But here we have a much better model uh, where you can clone yourself and quite literally increase genetic diversity. One of the things we rely on with genetic diversity, and this is, I'm going to go back to something you guys probably did in junior high, your old school Punnett squares, right? And they always use the blue eyes uh, or brown eyes, big B, little B, little B, little B type thing. One of the things we rely on with uh, genetics is, oops, that's supposed to be a little B, get out of here. There we go. Little B, little B. You guys know how to fill this in, hopefully. Uh, if not, we'll have another day for that. Uh, one of the things that we rely on though is mutations and you guys understand when breeding occurs we rely on copying genetics over you get half and half again as was just mentioned kind of weird during these transitory states where you can produce both sperm and egg sometimes those sperm and egg meet instead of becoming a what i, I haven't watched game of thrones my wife watches it uh, is it joffrey instead of becoming like a weird king joffrey weird mutated evil person um we actually rely on those copying errors to increase genetic diversity uh, i'm glad uh uh tunics were brought tunics were brought up uh they are a perfect example of where you can clone yourself and somehow increase your genetic breeding pool uh, we rely on alterations or mutations to occur uh, so picture filling out your punnett square and maybe this big B doesn't work. Uh, so this is both mom and dad. Sometimes the big B turns into an A type thing. Uh, we rely on, again, I, I feel like we're so confined to this mammalian idea. The idea of mutations typically is frowned upon. We won't, don't want a defect in our genetics, but let's be honest, it happens. And think of this more as like X-Men versus... Um, uh, a syndrome you don't want to find in, in your offspring type thing. This isn't like a negative, we need to go see a doctor and, and check this kid out. This is more like, whoa, this kid has superpowers. Uh, there's a weird mutation that occurred, even though you self-fertilized. Uh, it's it, it happens and it's, I realize it's weird and foreign to us, but sorry guys, again, we're in invertebrates now. Um, we rely on genetic copying errors and you can clone yourself and increase your genetic diversity. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, it's a very efficient and cool model when you understand the, the genetics that go behind it. Um, and yeah, uh, Mixini forms fall under the category that was just talked about uh, of animals that sometimes turn into functional hermaphrodites. They can breed with others. And as a fallback, oops, I bred with myself and my offsprings aren't genetically identical to me. Uh, so very cool, uh, unique style of survival. Uh, again, not advocating this for mammalian species. There's devastating effects very quickly, but uh, really effective in this scenario.
As far as uh, the hagfish themselves, we have a direct development. Uh, so larvae are born in the same uh, structure and identity uh, that they'll just grow into. Petromyzontiforms, on the other hand, which we'll talk about next, uh, do go through a true larval stage and then metamorphose into this beautiful adult that we see on our screen. With the feeding style and feeding acquisition, uh, we for a long time thought they were basically the earthworms of the ocean. They cruise around. Uh, the main goal of any mixini form is to get to the soft tissue first. So let's say a whale falls into the ocean, uh, falls to the bottom of the ocean, they're already in there. I guess I shouldn't have said fall into the ocean. Um, that's awkward. The whale falls to the bottom, something needs to churn through it. Uh, the idea of a mixini form is to bore into the body and eat the soft tissue. Uh, so first thing you want to do is usually go for the gut. Uh, you eat through the skin or outer surface of the stomach and then go into the animal and start processing all the smooth muscle, all the internal organs and the viscera. Uh, and then eventually you will eat your way back out of the animal uh, at whatever. It's, it's like a, it sounds like a Nickelodeon cartoon where you have to dive into something and work your way back out of the crazy maze. But that's what they do. Uh, they go in and go for the soft tissue and then eat the skin and the outer tissue from the inside out, uh, eventually leaving only bones, at which point uh, there's various, a, a lot of crustaceans uh, and quite a few bacteria come in to play. Uh, once the bones are exposed, we have all these different alien life forms settling on the corpse uh, and processing the whole thing out. It's it's very much like nothing goes to waste. Uh, it changes ecosystems forever. Uh, and mixini forms start off, they, they kick off the whole feeding frenzy whale buffet. Uh, so very, very valuable when it comes to that. And for a long time, that's kind of where we place them uh, as animals that do nothing but scavenge, essentially. However, as we found uh, through usually gut analysis, uh, so cutting the animals open after we capture them. We found a, a an interesting wrinkle in the story, uh, a breaking development, if you will. And that comes with the amount of living organisms, uh, or obviously once living, organisms we found uh, in their digestive tract, uh, including polychytes and amurans and dendrobranchs uh, and asteroids. The carry-on seemed, from what we've studied so far, seems to be kind of a added bonus, like if it's around, I'll take it. It's kind of like, um, picture your standard American office. It's like walking by the break room. You brought your lunch, you already had breakfast, but there's free donuts in the in the teacher's lounge type thing. You might pop in and have a donut. Uh, it seems like carry-on is that proverbial donut. Uh, the other animals uh, that consist primarily of their, make up most of their diet, uh, really show that they're pretty aggressive hunters as well. It's a lot of scientific names. Uh, for review purposes, anybody want to define all the highlighted words on your screen? Um, so polychaetes are going to be bristle worms. Uh, anomurins are going to be things like hermit crabs. The dendrobranchiata are going to be uh, prawns. Asteroids being starfish. Yeah, so a lot of animals that both we've talked about in this course, uh, and honestly, a lot of animals that you, you wouldn't expect a scavenger to be able to predate upon. Uh, this shows us a lot about the animal. They're effective hunters as well. Uh, they're they're not just they're they're not uh, the Oliver Twist style like waiting for a handout. Um, they're not sitting there like, please whale fall to the ocean floor. They're more than willing to go out uh, and get their non-existent hands dirty uh, and hunt for animals. And that kind of shattered a lot of the misconception we had about these animals. They're able to eat uh, a myriad of species. Uh, dendrobranchs, I think, are a unique example here. You've got a an animal that typically is characterized by its very hard to impact exoskeleton. So the fact they're able to eat that uh, sheds a lot of light on these animals' dietary lifestyles. In addition to that, and hopefully you guys are seeing a common theme here, uh, 
and I, I know I say it all the time, but this is what hundreds of millions of years will get you. Uh, we have, of course, backup plans in place. Uh, and arguably the greatest backup plan is that these animals are able to absorb dissolved matter through their skin, their entire bodies of feeding structure and their gills. So not only are you an earthworm, basically, uh, you're an earthworm that processes organic particulates throughout the ocean floor. Now, all of a sudden, you're able to absorb it through your skin, too. Um, it allows you very unique feeding opportunities. But let's think about where the animal lives. Why is absorbing organic particulates through the skin uh, even that much more effective based off both your environment, where you live, and, and just your general behavior? Like, what would, what would be the advantage of this trait? The advantage of being able to absorb nutrients through your skin is uh, because you're okay. So they're absorbing they're absorbing dissolved organic matter uh, through their skin, right? So what is dissolved organic matter? Um, it consists of anything. It's carbon heavy particles that have come fr that have become as a result of the process of breaking down organic matter um, through soluble, you know, reactions. So uh, like we talked about, they're the equivalent of an earthworm, but for the ocean, right? So um, take that and consider what, what they're eating. They're eating dead matter, but um, also anything that floats down to the benthic region is Sorry, I'm getting so distracted. <laughs> Anything that's uh, floating down to the benthic region that is not being consumed, um, I would even compare it to baleen whales, how they're able to have such a huge mass um, just based on eating microscopic organisms and whatever else gets caught in their, in their mouth um, and filtering in that water out. So, so these guys are taking things from their, like the carbon heavy particles from organic matter, like anything resulting from um, zooplankton, phytoplankton, bacteria, viruses, anything protozoic, um, you know, dead materials that have been uh, decomping in the water and float as it floats down and it's not being consumed. All of it's it's basically just like eating, but on a molecular level. Um, and they're this is how they also contribute through this aspect to the carbon cycle of or like you know, to turning the carbon into nutrients that are needed for photosynthesis, for example. Um, but also ground things from the groundwater that go into waterways or the ocean or just water bodies in general where um these organisms might be there the things from the groundwater it could be it's not only just biological or organic matter it could also be geological so like anything that can break down from like water, like uh, some kind of chemical reaction with water. So anything from rocks, even um, the chemicals produced or the the elements produced uh, from as a byproduct. Sorry, I'm like, it's in my head, but I'm trying to get it out uh, verbally. So anything produced in an elemental level from the environment's reactions with each other, um, with rocks or plant matter or anything terrestrial that's that's dead and, and decaying um that then when it rains or you're watering your lawn or anything else then that water then goes into the ground and and seeps into these waterways and the ocean etc and these particles aren't being consumed or utilized by anything else uh but the hagfish and organisms that might feed this way yeah exactly um the amount of debris particulate the water itself all still needs filtering and the fact that these animals dig themselves into a burrow fold in half and then while they're waiting for a feeding opportunity start absorbing all these particulates yeah that's a pretty good backup plan 
Um, it's like the equivalent of us as humans. Uh, we have lunch, but maybe halfway to dinner, we start feeling hungry. Oh, I can just walk outside and absorb all the sun and nice vibes around me. Yeah, that'll feed me too. Uh, so great backup plan uh, when it comes to feeding ecology. Uh, they're able to, like, they almost subconsciously are cleaning their environment without even knowing it. It's like, uh, it's like taking a nature walk and carrying around one of those trash picker uppers, little grabby arms, and just subconsciously almost picking stuff out of your environment and saying, okay, okay. Uh, and we're using those uh, to maximize the time span between feeding buffets. Uh, we know eventually something big is going to fall down. We'll eat it. In the meantime, uh, I can absorb my own environment uh, to keep me sustained uh, when it comes to feeding ecology and diet. So very useful survival strategy there. I'm also, we'll talk about this in a second, but while we're on this slide, I'm also glad it was brought up of everything is consumed, uh, including stuff like viruses, bacterias, uh, all these seemingly hurtful and harmful things to the body. Uh, we'll talk about that in a couple slides uh, when we get to um, how the, the digestive tract in the gut is actually set up. They have a, a few additions there as well. Hopefully by now you're seeing that is a, a theme across the board. Very primitive, yes. Much more than meets the eye though, absolutely. Uh, hopefully we're learning a bunch of things that are uncharacteristically advanced about such a unadvanced animal. With the diets that were just discussed, uh, the explanation of, of what uh, organic particulates is, is fantastic. Um, with that being said, though, we see now the true transition state. Um, and this is very important to point out. That's why most of it's highlighted. It's very important to recognize the fact that they are the true transitory state between both vertebrates and invertebrates. A lot of that comes not only from the development of that notochord, section 1A uh, underneath the notochord, is their ability to absorb nutrients. They truly have the transition from invertebrate uh, nutrient processing into vertebrate nutrient processing when it comes to how they actually acquire uh, and then send down the Amazon shipping assembly line, uh, how they assemble all these nutrients and how they're able to separate everything out. Uh, it's the true, um, literal, we can look at it today, visual representation about when we go from being invertebrates to the people we are now, um, there, there's a lot to process and digest, but um, um, man, I've got all sorts of good jokes today. Uh, it's a great way to process though, all the intricate inner workings of the animal. And we very rarely get a chance to look at this. We've talked all semester about uh, monophyles and shared synapomorphies. So that shared derived characteristic here we can see it. Uh, it's living today. We can observe it. We can study it. Um, so again, I, I know nobody took this course with the idea of working with animals like this, but what an opportunity. Like you get a look at any animal you want to work with, this is the animal you should study first. Uh, this is your your origin story. It's the it's it provides us so many clues and hints as to how evolution works. Uh, and again, fortunate to still have it alive today. The overhand knot comes into play again with feeding, uh, with that amazing image I drew earlier, uh, the sword and the stone thing, it provides a fulcrum, uh, and that feeding advantage gives them an upper hand. You're able to do kind of the best of both worlds and not many animals have mastered that. You can go very deep in the ocean because you don't have a true skeleton. And then while that would be a disadvantage for many animals, uh, that overhand knot behavior allows them to, I guess the it gives them arms and legs. Uh, so it, it really is a, a true behavioral advantage. You're able to transition any depth uh, and traverse any obstacle in your environment, uh, squeeze through, fit through, bend around, uh, any 
possible obstacle you could uh, run into. And while the disadvantage typically would be like picture a snake, for example, uh, they're not going to be able to perform this because they have that tricky old skeleton sitting in there. Uh, now you're able to get leverage on whatever prey item you're consuming with that overhand not behavior. So you know it's good for releasing you of slime. You also know now that it's good for feeding advantages. Uh, these animals, uh, you got to give them like a gold star, like, hey, bud, you really figured it out. They, they've made a lot out of very, very little. There's that beauty. Uh, again, the reason this picture is on your screen, aside from just your simple enjoyment, um, with this dental plate being able to move only this way, up and down for the most part, it helps if the body can start almost rattling um, or shaking loose that uh, usually external skin. Once they're inside the animal and eating the viscera, the up and down motion is sufficient, uh, but we tie a knot now all of a sudden, and we've got the knife and the fork, if you will, for consuming prey. Uh, makes them very, very efficient, both predators and just general consumers. And as was mentioned earlier, picture this too, the entire time, let's say a whale falls to the bottom. The entire time you're eating through this animal, once you're inside, you're just generally absorbing all the nutrients from that animal too. You're able to digest throughout your entire uh, epidermal area. Your entire body's a feeding organ. Uh, so it, it's, it's a two for one discount. It's like going to a buffet and having someone holding another plate behind you. Uh, it, it's a guaranteed mechanism to ensure uh, nutrient absorption. With the feeding styles, the best examples we have are when we drop uh, a camera in usually a body deep into the ocean. Uh, occasionally, uh, some of the unmanned subs have stumbled upon a whale carcass, um, and it's riddled with hagfish. They're there to consume, process out. We'll talk about this more with sharks too. Uh, we call it whale fall. Whale fall is, it's, it's not confined just to whales. It could be sharks or large fish like tuna, things like that. When we have a large bodied organism that sinks to the ocean floor, it changes that ecosystem forever. Uh, not forever, I guess, 15 years-ish. Um, it, it changes everything. You have animals that typically go off feast or famine. This is the feast. Uh, and the feeding ecology changes that entire ecosystem. You have hundreds of thousands of hagfish show up. Um, you're going to get all the bacteria, all the, um, usually a lot of crustaceans show up. It changes that environment. It's like whatever your favorite restaurant is, picture that opening up right next door to you. Uh, it, it, it's a game changer. Uh, it, provides a huge resource abundance for animals that aren't used to it. Uh, so usually it serves as a breeding site as well. Um, yeah, I, I know it sounds gross. It's not super appetizing, but a giant carcass falling to the ocean floor is like having your favorite restaurant open up next door and you get to eat there every day. It, it changes your dietary lifestyle. Um, and yeah, it, it affects ecosystems much more than just, oops, a whale died. There's a lot more that goes into it. The more we've looked into these animals, we found out some interesting stuff. Uh, they're notorious for showing up as what we call bycatch, a term you should be familiar with now. Um, fishing nets, especially uh, where we have systems set up in place where you leave a net out and then come back and pick it up days later. Uh, all the possibly dead or just basically trapped fish uh, is of course just a giant beacon. It's like a, a, a blinking light to go to. It's, it's the North Star for hagfish. Uh, they see that as just a giant, hey, there's vacancy at this buffet. Uh, so they do wind up uh, aggregating around uh, catches of both fish and invertebrates. Um, they'll come and feed and they ruin a lot of what should be a valuable catch because everything's covered in slime, has holes in it. Uh, yeah, it, it's pretty nasty. Basically, that becomes undesirable seafood as well it should. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's like cutting open an apple and finding the worm, so to speak. 
they they ruin a lot of what should be valuable catches uh, just by their feeding acquisition style. They've further been observed, especially uh, with the red band fish. That's why he's on your screen. Cool fish. They almost burrow the exact same way that uh, hagfish do. The again, like the science, thankfully has went back in and reinvestigated how hagfish work. Uh, we thought that they were slimy and gross. Yeah, nature doesn't just make you slimy and gross for fun. Now we know it's for predator avoidance. It's also for hunting. Um, and in this case, we have the hagfish cruising along the bottom, finding a burrow where usually, again, the red band fish is. Uh, cruise along, we find a red band fish, and we know we can't actively like take it down. It's not like a lion hunting a gazelle. They'll actually swim into the burrow and then just start producing slime. They'll sit there and allow the animal to suffocate in all that slime cloud. They do their overhead knot, uh, release themselves of the slime so that they can breathe just fine. And they're literally uh, doing kind of a, a choke hold on any species that burrows. They're able to slime it. Like seriously, it sounds like a, I, I feel like I'm describing an X-Men right now of their secret powers. Uh, you're able to go in, slime it, make it suffocate, and you'll drag it out using your dental plates and you can consume at your leisure. Uh, so they've taken, and we, we don't see this very often, they've taken a defense mechanism and turned it into a hunting adaptation. Uh, it's, like I said, I, I, I have so much respect for this animal. It's, it's disgusting and ugly and has made everything work out in their favor, despite all the odds. Um, this is like your iconic teenage movie where the girl wears overalls and glasses and all of a sudden at the end it becomes prom queen. Um, that's what the hagfish is. It, it's, it's prom queen. Um, it, it's, it's shown us and taught us so much about how to make, take advantage, I guess, of every adaptation you have while kind of flying under the radar, so to speak. Uh, just, I don't know. I, I think it's a crazy cool animal uh, that's very humbling uh, to us simple humans and mammals. Uh, they're able to do a lot with very, very little. As if that wasn't enough yet, uh, picture what they're eating. So they're active predators, very efficient hunters, uh, but their main golden corral that opens for them, I'm not sponsored, but golden corral, if you want to sponsor me, please watch this YouTube video. Um, this is the golden corral for them though, when a huge, again, whale fall occurs, does not have to be a whale. Any organism that falls to the bottom that's large bodied, it becomes a feeding frenzy. As was mentioned earlier, when we talked about that organic processing of nutrients, there's some snags that come with that, right? We can't just eat carry on. Uh, we can't just eat decaying organic matter. That's typically not good for the system. Uh, it, it's like you wouldn't eat uh, a steak that had turned green in the refrigerator. Uh, not a good idea. Please don't do that. There, there's hangups and snags that come with consuming all this dead, decaying matter. What do we do about that? Oh, I'll tell you what they do. Uh, this is arguably the most iconic representation of that transition from a couple slides ago, that transition from invertebrate to vertebrate life, it, a lot of it stems from the digestive tract. Uh, and that's when we introduce the paratrophic matrix. Uh, the paratrophic matrix is something that sets these animals up for great success, but uh, is our, aside from the vertebral column, this is where that marker is. Hey, we know this animal shares traits with invertebrates and vertebrates. Um, and the paratrophic matrix is that, if, if we're watching like a, a graph readout, this is that huge spike. This is that, whoa, we need to identify that. Um, and the paratrophic matrix is not unique just to hag, uh, hagfish. It's found in other animals. Anybody got ideas of where else we might find a paratrophic matrix? So you can find it in things like flies, earwigs, like butterflies, moths, locusts. Um, animals like that that 
would benefit from the aid in digestion um, as well as just having like large and awkward prey um, that that's going to help them digest and kind of protect their internal organs from stuff like rupture and puncture as well. Yeah, we're, we're going to find it in a, a myriad of insect species as we're just listed. Um, and with that, uh, we get, it's like a, I don't know how many of you are, are, are professional chefs or do this in your kitchen very often. Uh, it's like a strainer, like you're pouring pasta out, plus a cheesecloth. Uh, cheesecloth is, is a fabric and material typically used to strain out very fine particulates. Um, that's what the paratrophic matrix is. It essentially encap encapsula encapsulates, geez, encapsulates the gut the entire way down um, where you're able to take on nutrients and it separates out the bad. Uh, it doesn't allow bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, things like that to enter into the bloodstream. Uh, the most common example I can think of are mosquitoes. It's the reason mosquitoes are so uh, dangerous to us as humans, because they have a very efficient paratrophic matrix, meaning they can feed on someone maybe with a bloodborne illness, pass it on to someone, and yet never be affected themselves. Uh, the matrix allows them to ingest the blood, get the nutrients they need, and sanguivores just in general, just FYI, are not an efficient model. Blood is incredibly nutrient deficient. Um, that's why they have to feed so often and, and engorge themselves so much. But that aside, uh, when you're feeding on blood, there's tons of illnesses that can occur. The paratrophic matrix separates that out. It's why almost every sanguivore is a carrier for disease, but is never affected themselves. Uh, their digestive tract, their mouths, their saliva, their blood themselves, like. All of it seems very dangerous, but the animal is unaffected. Uh, and it's all thanks to uh, this cheesecloth that lines the digestive tract. Uh, and as we just heard, there's a ton of insects that exhibit this behavior, and it's almost always correlated with animals that feed off less than desirable uh, food items at times. So incredibly unique adaptation here where we've got a true digestive tract like we would see in mammals. Um, where swallow, ingest, process, absorb nutrients, uh, excrete. Uh, it, it follows all those guidelines, but then is wrapped in this extra little uh, holographic barrier uh, from like a sci-fi movie that allows all the nutrients to enter the bloodstream and filters out everything that could be decaying or rotting uh, from that organism. So this is that true transitory moment between invertebrate and vertebrate life. Uh, a lot of it has to do here with the digestive tract. Put simply, digestive tract of a mammal and paratrophic matrix of an invertebrate. Uh, very, very cool adaptation for them. I'll leave this up here for a second just to let you soak it all in. We move on now to the petromyzontiforms. Uh, hagfish are definitely the unique species of the ignathans, I feel. Um, Petromyzontiforms were moving much more towards vertebrate life uh, and a vertebrate parasite, which is again very unusual, but that's what we have here. Uh, Petromyzontiforms definitely deserve their own day, uh, but a lot of what we've discussed today should focus on the Agnathan's uniqueness in general, uh, and Mixini forms make up a lot of it. Within Agnathan, though, we have to acknowledge Petromyzontiforms. Uh, they've got quite a few adaptations of their own. Uh, to start with, they're gonna operate completely different than hagfish with their lifestyle choices, uh, as far as what body of water they're moving to and from. Um, they're what we call inguiliforms, which is eel-like. Uh, they're gonna be hatched in freshwater, migrate to the ocean, uh, and then return to freshwater to spawn. I don't doubt that in your head, all of you are thinking, oh, that's the same thing salmon do. Yes, uh, you are correct. But there are other forms of dromy, so to speak, with how animals migrate in and out. Can anybody tell me the maybe opposite of anadromous uh, and what that entails? Maybe some animals in that. 
The opposite of anadromous is uh, catadromous, and it basically covers the fish that migrate downriver into the ocean to spawn. And these species often, or, or they do spend most of their lifetime in freshwater and travel to the sea specifically to spawn. Um, American eels, European eels, sturgeons do this. Yeah, um, anguilliforms are probably the most notorious. Anguilliforms are the actual name assigned to eels. Uh, and eels do this, oddly enough. A lot of people have no idea that this occurs. Um, American eels, though, will spend their life in freshwater, migrate out to sea to breed. It's, it's the exact inverse correlation of anadromous. Um, migrate out to sea to breed and then swim back upstream to usually die off and spend the rest of their adult lives uh, Anadromous, though, is by far, in a way, the more popular version, uh, the more recognized, where we start off in freshwater, uh, move, uh, or excuse me, start off uh, salt, freshwater, uh, fresh again. So it's it's an interesting behavior, yes, but I hope that all you guys at home are understanding what really goes into it. Uh, there's so much more than... Oh, I'm going to swim upstream and then go out to the ocean. Picture all the things we've talked about this semester of the, the dealing with salinity, uh, osmosis, dehydration risk versus overhydration risk. Uh, there is so much that plays into uh, both catadromous and anadromous lifestyles. Um, there's so much biochemistry involved. Uh, it's, it's really astounding. It, it's... I don't know. It's the same thing I've preached to you guys and harp on you all semester about. Uh, when we say these, it's just, it's just a term on your screen right now. I hope you're also taking with that, though, the impact that this has on an animal and the evolution it took to get there. Uh, next week or so, when we talk about sharks, when we start talking about bull sharks, especially being able to move up and down stream uh, into the ocean or freshwater or brackish and dealing with that environment, it's a big deal. It'd be like saying we could all just walk into outer space and then jump right back onto Earth. That's the, the difference in equilibrium and balance in your environment. Uh, there, there's a lot going on uh, that I think goes unnoticed or unrecognized quite often. Can I ask a question? Of course. Um, so with the anadromous species coming in uh, to the rivers from the ocean, um, you'll have a lot of predators such as whales uh, specific, or even other um, marine mammals. But let's talk about like killer whales kind of stalking the inlets for, I mean, I know this is kind of more in the, the subarctic, but um, so for example, like the whales that stalk the inlets for these species of fish, um, are there any predators that might benefit uh, or that do or might or are known for i'm sorry are known for um doing this and maybe even kind of doing some population control on the jawless fishes for example um that do this without being devoured from the inside out yeah i mean yeah that's there's so much going on with that question um I know, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's just, that's a almost a lecture on its own. Um, that ability to, eventually you guys will learn the term urohaline. That's that ability to mitigate different aqueous environments uh, in terms of salinity. Um, and agnathans fill a unique role within that. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot going on there. I'm not even sure how to tackle that entire, it, it's a, Great uh, proposal of a question. I'll, I'll tell you what, let's address that when we start talking killer whales and sharks and their relationship. Um, yeah, it, it's a perfect time to bring that up though because it does transition nicely to what we're gonna talk about next week. Um, so yeah, let, let's keep that ball rolling uh, and I will have the text on the screen to follow along with that because we, we do address a very similar issue uh, when we talk about that awkward uh, 
phase and, and how it affects both the ecosystem itself and the animals living within it. Um, yeah, excellent, excellent job. Yeah, that's just really good. That that's a. I, I feel like I want to pull up the other PowerPoint right now. I don't want to diverge from this, but yeah, there there's a lot to process there. Before we move on, everybody good so far? Uh, again, what we're going to address that question and come back to it uh, and explain it a little better with some text on the screen. But yeah, that's money. Anybody got other questions or anything they want to add from uh, the start of Petromizonta forms or, or back with Mixini forms uh, regarding any of the adaptations they have? Because it's a big transition here. Okay, I have the weirdest fun fact. So upon research and diving into the the whole of like the matrix um, and how it works with like digestion, um, besides it being obviously like a membrane and the way toxins go through, um, it works as almost like a mechanical. Um, I don't, what's the word I'm looking for? Do, like. It can withstand, I think the equivalent when I ended up do, like doing the math is like 0 0.7 PSI, which doesn't seem really impressive, but basically that like surrounds the food bolus and makes sure that I nothing were this. to, one second, honey. Yeah, like an air compressor. Yeah, like nothing were to, to rupture um, or like protect their internal organs. Um, and I think it's crazy that it's like, some weird i just picture like food being covered in this slime and it trying to like break free and the slime's like nah -uh, like you're not gonna poke my organs today um just like this crazy adaptation of making sure that like they're protected both like their organs being lined and then the food itself being engulfed and yeah 0 0.7 psi from that little slime bolus <laughs> It's it blows so my mind. It's so cool. Yeah, it's it's so fascinating. The the cheesecloth explanation is just a simple version. I'm glad somebody brought up the actual complexity that really goes into it. Um, this is yeah, it's the equivalent of. I guess nowadays it's perfectly normal to use this as a relevant analogy. Um, it's like somebody going through a mega quarantine, and you have armed guards standing there the whole time as you go through the x-ray machine and all this stuff like there's so much both pressure uh and filtration process uh like you're not going to be allowed to slip something to another inmate type thing like you are guarded you are watched there's tons of in this case literal pressure but for your education purposes a, a visual representation of pressure being on you all eyes are on you uh Nothing moves in and out of a Mixini form's body uh, without going through, like, this is TSA times a million. Uh, like, no liquids over 0.3 grams, and you have to throw out your shampoo and no outside food or drink. Uh, this is metal detector, TSA, x ray scanning, full body cavity search. Uh, like, you're not getting away with anything uh, thanks to that paratrophic matrix. There is a lot that goes into it. Uh, keeping the I'm using visual representations of pressure on you, but as was just mentioned, the actual pressure on that organism uh, is insane. All thanks to this magical little paratrophic matrix. And again, like hopefully it's starting to hit home. Like, I'm sorry, invertebrates are wicked awesome compared to the things that we can do. If you go, like we'll get sick if we eat Taco Bell that's been left out for a day or two. Uh, our, our bodies are so sensitive, whereas this animal, you could eat uh, Taco Bell from six weeks ago that's just been sitting on the kitchen counter. Um, you'll get whatever nutrients are left and none of the bad stuff. Uh, so really, really unique uh, adaptations in that regard. All right, I think everybody's good. If not, let me know. But we're going to discuss really quickly that uh, larval form of the lamprey. In order to put this into perspective, I'm sorry, I have to go back to this. Uh, this is the iconic lamprey form right here. It's the one that haunts everyone's dreams. Nobody likes it. I understand. That's a perfectly reasonable thing. I am a huge lover of invertebrates, and even I will admit to you, yeah, I'm not going to mess with that. Uh, that that's, that's unnecessary. That, that's pretty gross. But uh, 
if it helps alleviate your concerns about this horrifying animal, they spend a lot of their lives like this. Uh, we call them amocytes. You'll also hear them uh, explained in, in videos and if you're doing research on it. Um, amocytes, amocoites, uh, you'll hear it phrased differently, uh, different places you look. Um, but amocytes are what they spend a lot of their life as. Uh, really, the last couple years of their life are when they turn into the crazy facehugger alien version. Um, for a majority of their lifespan, they're going to look like this. It's much less menacing. They honestly look very similar to tadpoles. Uh, they spend their days swimming around limbless uh, and producing copious amounts of mucosal strands, uh, so almost filaments that come off the body and it traps food particulates, so they're cleaning the waterways. Uh, they barely have mouths at all. Um, certainly not the horrifying mouth we just saw, but they're very, like, almost simple. Like, you might give a little boop on the snout and say, oh, you're an adorable little animal, you little tadpole monster. Uh, of course, they're going to transform afterwards after they've gained your trust into horrifying monsters. Uh, but until then, they spend a lot of their life looking like this. Like, that's not going to scare anybody. Uh, that just looks like a very sad fish. Um, once they do transform and go through metamorphosis into adulthood, uh, they, of course, take on a whole new menacing appearance. But it's, believe it or not, a very short time uh, that they actually live as those menacing adults. Almost their entire lives are spent in this amocyte model, uh, a tadpole, mucosal, uh, very limited mouth dexterity animal. Uh, they're almost uh, living the existence of like a placostomus, a, a cleaner fish. Uh, so something that you want in that environment. And then they transition into adulthood. The horror movie becomes rated R and then they'll die. Uh, they're literally transitioning to that crazy version just for spawning purposes. Uh, they die very shortly after, usually within a year, uh, but does not make their uh, metamorphose any more enjoyable knowing that they'll die soon because uh, they, they will still haunt your dreams for at least a year. With uh, Mixini forms, uh, we discussed, uh, and everybody chimed in too, the transitory period between what constitutes a vertebrate versus an invertebrate versus just the notochord uh, and then being a chordate versus a invertebrate. So that was a topic of debate. Here we don't really have a debate. Uh, we've got, we, we're not going to ever see that overhand not behavior. Uh, we've got a very primitive but very real and very present true vertebra, uh, a complete brain case, things like that. So if you want to, you, you, you deniers out there can say, hey, I'm not related to hagfish, but I would take the hagfish over this because you have to acknowledge that you're related to this animal. Um, if anybody wants to take a screenshot right now, you're welcome to. Uh, you can take that to Kinko's, get it printed and framed and blown up on your wall as your original ancestor. Uh, I don't think 23andMe or Ancestry.com includes this animal, but it should definitely be on your lineage. Uh, this is... I mean, science-wise, the hagfish is definitely the start of vertebrate life, but no matter what, this is your great-great a billion times over. Uh, Great-great-grandfather right here um, is coming to say hi. We have to acknowledge the evolutionary history that takes place and how this animal got us to where we are today. This is our definite rudiment vertebrae. A couple other unique traits with them. Uh, one is the single nostril or nair. Usually you guys have heard the term nares, uh, but this is a singular nair, uh, a single nostril on the dorsal aspect, uh, meaning top side of the head, uh, very unique among living vertebrates. I know some of you are probably thinking whales. That's a story for another day, and we'll talk about how the, the proverbial blowhole works uh, as opposed to a nair. But this is a single nostril, which is very, very unique amongst true vertebrates, which we're in now. The sucker-like mouth does have a very menacing appearance. Um, this is kind of close to what we discussed a while back with cephalopods. 
um, a rasp-like tongue. It's not the same as a radula. Essentially what you have is kind of a cigar cutter method. Uh, and while this image is on the screen, let me elaborate as to how these animals feed. This is basically the hardest, most cartilaginous part of the body. Um, it's designed to be rigid, but have some uh, flexibility to it, meaning you can move this sucker mouth around any part of the body, but once it's adhered, it can hold its own form. Um, this is the world's worst hickey, is how these animals feel. Um, it essentially molds to, contours to your body, uh, wraps around, then that hard cat cartilaginous rings suction cup itself on using all these teeth. All these are for adherence. These all pin in to the animal's body, all these little teeth. After that, the animal basically starts sucking in the skin uh, or the tissue in general. So you've latched on. Uh, we've got a great suction cup, a great, uh, if, it's the equivalent of like, a, if you guys have ever done it, like if you have those shower suction cups or done it on the uh, table or a marble countertop thing, it's the equivalent of like using a standard suction cup versus after you get it a little wet, all of a sudden that thing's going to adhere and you might not be able to pull it off. Uh, so this thing is a plunger that applies itself to uh, animal's tissue, starts not only adhering to, but actually prying up the surface. Um, it's going to raise the skin through this death hickey. Uh, and then back here, we have the tongue that does all the work. Uh, it works like a cigar cutter as skin is sucked in. This thing's just rapidly moving up and down, uh, chopping off and consuming parts of the animal's body. Uh, it is as horrifying as it looks. Obviously, there wasn't going to be a happy explanation to this picture. Um, it's not like, oh, yeah, so it eats just plants and vegetables. Uh, super healthy, goes to Panera once a week, it's a cheat day. Like, no, that's, that's not how this story ends. Uh, it adheres, dives all of these horrible spikes that are in, inward facing into the animal skin, uh, starts basically, again, kind of that hickey motion where you're sucking skin, not just adhering to it, sucking skin in. Uh, after the skin is broke, uh, we'll feed on blood, tissue, whatever they can pull. Um, very violent, aggressive, parasitic lifestyle for these animals. The Again, that cartilaginous ring around the mouth, um, creates a, a, it's still true, but it's not the only modality of feeding these animals have. Um, it does label them as parasites very often, but they have been known to just consume prey in general, uh, mostly invertebrates, uh, earthworm type species, uh, polychiates, things like that. Uh, small invertebrates that can just be consumed that you don't need to latch onto. Uh, so they can predate uh, but typically they're better known uh, for their parasitic lifestyle. With that parasitic lifestyle, uh, the idea of, and this is a great picture, hopefully it's big enough on all of your screens. Um, this is an old lamprey wound. Uh, you can see the iconic, again, they, they look like leeches. Uh, maybe you're from, more familiar with that imagery. Um, it looks like that iconic leech mark, uh, but it's where the animal has latched on, basically almost inhaled the skin, and then started severing it as it sucked quite literally the life and the tissue off this animal. Um, but as bad of a rap as they get, uh, and, they, and they deservedly so, um, I'm not trying to paint them as a, a hero here, but we're typically not supposed to find uh, a lot of detriment to their prey species. Um, one of the odd things about being a parasite, um, what would be the ideal life for a parasite? Anybody want to chime in? Like, what would be the ideal life for a parasite? And while nobody's going to respect your life choices, uh, what's the iconic kind of life choice for a parasite to truly succeed? <laughs> So, I mean, your end goal as a parasite is to basically do as little as possible. Um, so naturally killing your host or causing your host to deteriorate to a point that you're no longer benefiting from them means you have to find a new host. 
which is a whole lot of work. Um, so there's this really fine line with a parasite and say like a fish being able to survive a lamprey, like a single one, um, as a parasite themselves, their functionality and their lifestyle works. They can keep their host alive. But at the point that we get into like infestation waters, um, where the host subject is overrun, um, that's where we start to run into like detriment and killing the host in which case all of them now need to find a new host in a new lifestyle, which kind of goes against the whole do as little as possible to begin with. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's, that's yeah, exactly. Like I, I, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Um, yeah. Just like, don't do it right now, especially not if you're eating, but if after this you go and just Google, uh, you can look up heartworm, things like that any of these infestation of parasites, the animal only dies if there's a true infestation uh, when it's over, overdone, overkill. Because um, the, like, like it was just mentioned, like the iconic parasite lifestyle is to just feed off your host and they cruise along, you're living your life, uh, they're working a little extra hard because of you. But what a terrible uh, plan if your idea is to kill the host, even with humans. Um, and I know this is a, a, a rough subject to broach right now, but even viruses and things like that, um, diseases, viruses, bacterials, uh, their goal is to live in a host and reproduce, just like every other animal out there. Um, their goal's not, and again, I'm not trying to anthropomorphize viruses or make light of them, uh, but their goal is to have a sufficient host so they can reproduce and pass on their uh, virusness uh, elsewhere. The goal is never of anything that's parasitic or viral or bacterial. The goal is never to kill the host. Um, the goal is to be passed on via that host at whatever detriment happens. Um, but yeah, just, just think of it from a survival strategy. You don't want a bunch of like, you know, right here in this picture, this lamp right here, or this uh, parasite uh, is secretly like kicking this guy like, hey, this is my fish get your own fish, um, go next door, find another one. This is my area, this is my turf. And while yes, they, they do run rampant and can devastate populations of fish, that's not the ideal design. Uh, the idea is like everybody buddy up. It's a, it's a disgusting partnership system, but everybody grab your fish and then go on your way um, hand in hand, so to speak, and live out your best life. That's the iconic parasite lifestyle. Of course, it doesn't work that way. These animals are going to be reproducing. Um, prey animals might be low in numbers. So yeah, you're going to have die off, but that's not the intention behind the iconic parasite lifestyle. But yeah, not not much to add after what was said. Like, it's just, it's not a good model. Um, it, it occurs quite often, but it's because of an overabundance, not because that animal is designed to just take out fish populations. That's a terrible survival strategy. Your survival depends on the health of your host. Um, and again, maybe health's a, a bad term. The work ethic of your host, as long as they're willing to, at a detriment, work even harder, that's your iconic thing. Like, It's like having a really good employee and you get to sit back and they're doing all the work for you. You don't want that employee to quit, uh, but you definitely want to take credit for all the cool things they do. Um, that's that's your parasite lifestyle in a American office surrounding. With uh, the overarching thing that I think you'll see over uh, the course of the semester, just like almost every other invasive species, we're the reason for it. Um, we basically allow them into the Great Lakes um, in North America. And then we were like, man, there's an invasive species here. What can I do to uh, curtail their invasion? I know, let's connect all of the Great Lakes. That was our solution. Um, so man-made structures uh, and canals lead to all the Great Lakes being connected. And we introduce lampreys ourselves uh, to the entire uh, ecosystem, fishing industry. I, I always think it's funny whenever, just, just as a 
something to place in the back of your mind. Whenever you go through life and you hear that's an invasive species, more than likely I would Google it. It's probably because of human introduction. We act like these animals just came in and set up shop and started taking over stuff. Yeah, we gave them the foundation for their homes. Uh, we're, we're usually the reason behind it. And off the top of my head, I honestly can't think of any species that's invasive and devastating the ecosystem that we didn't have a big hand in. Um, this is no exception. Basically, lampreys start taking over uh, the Great Lakes in the 50s, uh, devastate the fishing population. And again, let's go back a couple slides real quick. That's because the whole time they look like this. So nobody's thinking anything of it. In fact, fish are eating them more often than not. Um, you're thinking, oh, hey, awkward tadpole, uh, come into the Great Lakes. And then a couple of years later, here we are. We get that. Um, so like, hey, honest mistake. I get it. I, I understand why it happens. But we 100% are responsible for the devastating effect they've had on them. To combat that issue, uh, we've developed a couple methods, some more interesting, um, some kind of awkward and a little bit, I don't know, I guess shady uh, at times. But uh, lampricide eventually comes out. Uh, and lampricide is used in a myriad of ways. Uh, anybody familiar with lampricide or its, its usages and, and how they implement that in an environment? Yes. So lampricide um, is a... A chem sorry, I was, I was like thinking. Um, lambricide is a chemical composed of uh, different chemicals used to kill the the larval stage of lampreys. So what they do is uh, lambricide will be sprayed into areas of lakes or uh, tributaries, or, like rivers or streams that go into lakes from the ocean. Um, anywhere that any part of a water flow or water body that favors a nursery environment for lampreys. Um, the commonly used component of the lampricide is called TFM, which, and I wrote it down so I can give you guys some body behind it and give it that really like scary chemical um, effect that it really is. It's TFM stands for trifluoromethyl nitrophenol. Um, and it's used for its ability to pass through organic or biological membranes. Um, and this chemical breaks into the, lar the larva on a cellular level, breaking up multiple cellular processes, which then not only stops growth and development, but ultimately kills the larva. Um, before they can develop their destructive mouths um, and start, you know, re wreaking havoc all over the place. Uh, the downside of lampricides is that the other, like other aquatic animals, such as amphibians and um, ant fish that have a more primitive structure, um, like sturgeons, uh, primitive body structures are still around obviously because they work, but they also, um, not that they can't adapt, but they also are affected by this uh, permeable, permeable, yeah, permeable uh, solution. So um, it does have a detrimental effect on at least those two categories of species that live in waterways, uh, lakes, oceans, but um, it doesn't seem to affect true fish. Um, just because uh, they don't have that, they don't have that sensitive uh, outer layer of, you know, their skin like lampreys do and amphibians as well. I'm so glad amphibians were brought up because uh, I hope this doesn't need to be said here. You know for a fact, all of you, you can't just go out and spray a uh, pesticide basically into the water and be like, oh, it just affects lampreys. Um, it's the roundup of the seas. Uh, obviously, anything that's able to absorb, and again, I'm so glad amphibians were on that list because A, an animal that I'm very passionate about, uh, but an animal that has no choice but to absorb whatever's in its environment. Um, obviously, lampricide came with some caveats. Uh, of course, fish weren't affected. They've got, uh, 
external uh, dermal layer, that doesn't mean, uh, hey, anything in the water has to come into my body. They're able to filter a lot of that out or block it entirely. Um, but the petromyzontiforms and amphibians uh, definitely were affected. You can't just spray, it'd be like pouring bleach it on the weeds in your yard. Uh, yeah, the grass is gonna die too, not good. It's gonna leach through the soil, uh, make its way around. In this case, you're just spraying it in the ocean and hoping for the best. It did work, uh, it helped uh, curtail the invasion that again, we started. Um, but nowadays it's actually been implemented in a new development. Uh, and it's super interesting. Uh, they've used it now to, they've altered the genetic makeup of it, um, the, the cellular and chemical composition of the lampreyside initially. Now what they do is they go out and they catch all the lampreys that they can. They will throw the females actually back out into the water um, or sometimes they kill them, which is again, I'm not advocating for killing invertebrates. We all love invertebrates. Yeah, it's okay if, if these animals aren't introduced back in. But what they'll do is they'll take all the males, uh, they inject them with the new Lampreyside 2.0, and what it does is it sterilizes the males, and then they re-release them. Um, so yes, it seems very counterintuitive to re-release a invasive species, but uh, it turns out when lampreys breed and reproduce, they only copulate once. Um, and so the females meet a male, uh, they will release egg and sperm respectively, except the male's sterile and the female has dumped out her clutch of eggs, if you will, and therefore wasted the entire breeding season. Uh, she'll only do it once. So by sterilizing the males, releasing them back out, you're fitting the population through a very, I, I guess, uh, subversive, like, spy mode um you're allowing i guess what's the term now catfishing um, you're catfishing all the female lampreys in the river saying hey here's a perfectly good male wink wink um and believe it or not it's really helping uh combat and honestly it's 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 like taking them out um very efficiently it's it's a shady practice um of course, because again, you're you're basically the uh, catfishing everyone, uh, setting out all these males on dates, and it turns out that they're they've been frauds all along. Um, yeah, it was. What what's the? I was just watching it. Uh, the, the new Disney thing, uh, Wandavision. It was Agatha or Agnatha all along. Now, uh, it was Agatha all along, uh, and you tricked you've duped an entire population into breeding, releasing their eggs that will never be fertilized. Um, and so I, I personally think it's a really cool approach to battling an invasive species. Uh, it's something that's not used very often. Uh, the idea of sterilizing the males, but then again, I, I think the part that's so counterintuitive, re-releasing all these invasive species back into the ocean and back into the seas and back into the waterways uh, allowing them to false, falsely breed, uh, that's what's actually doing the, the biggest impact on curbing these populations. Uh, so cool approach, different than usual conservation efforts, uh, but certainly noteworthy. Uh, with the fossil record for these animals, uh, we don't have much to go off of. We know they came after Mixini forms, uh, but the reason this is the last slide is just to point out uh, Think about our timeline here. We've got 500 plus million years ago for Mixini forms. This is the start of that evolutionary time span. And we've only got 300 million years ago. Um, as far as I did, of course, ocean, uh, oceanic animals are much more difficult to identify uh, just based off what we can dig up. Plus there's barely any actual skeletal mass to observe. But you can see hopefully from this, we've got 600 or 750 million years ago, we have, we know vertebrates start. Uh, and I mean, heck, even 400 million years ago, we've got the first vertebrate life on earth. So yes, there's still kind of that missing link, but we still have hagfish, uh, like it or not, sorry, but 
we still have hagfish, which really are that they bridge that gap between when we transition from invertebrate life, uh, which this course is entirely focused on, to vertebrate life, uh, we have the, the evidence there. Uh, everything's connected and we, we truly have finally gotten to that animal where we are at a transitory state between invertebrate zoology and then zoology as you know it, uh, dealing with all those silly vertebrates with their spines and bones and things like that. Uh, from here, we focus on animals that start developing skeletons, but they're cartilaginous. Uh, so sharks, skates, rays, things like that. Uh, but for now, we've identified that what should be a missing link, uh, but fortunately is so well adapted to survival uh, that they're still around today. So hopefully it shed light on a distant relative of yours that you may not want in your genealogy or family tree. It's there nonetheless, uh, but hopefully that kind of highlighted a an animal that yeah, doesn't deserve a lot of love, but secretly it really does. Um, nobody's gonna give it a big hug, but man, they, they, they deserve one. Uh, we've got the start of the notochord, the spinal cord, and almost terrestrial mammal uh, digestive tracts. So we owe a lot here uh, to animals like this. Um, and yeah, we, we paid them their due, they had their day. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed. And from here, we move on to the start of kind of vertebral life on Earth.